people have asked me when I was writing the book and Ahalya had just come out, they had asked me that, how are you uh, planning to portray Kunti? Would you show her as a loving mother or would you show her as manipulative? And my answer was, uh, I would show her as ambitious. That entire journey from a manipulative to ambitious, you know, these are just two words. But there is a huge, huge difference between these two words. And there's a huge journey. Hello and welcome to Gulp Lok. I'm Antara Chakrabarti and today we meet again for another episode of Bookmarked where we are going to discuss an extremely engaging read entitled Kunti, authored by Koral Das Gupta, published in the year 2021 by Pan Macmillan. Before I go ahead to give a broad overview of the book, I would like to introduce you all to our esteemed panelists that we have with us today. We have with us our first panelist, Priyanka Tripathi, Associate Professor, Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Patna. Her interest areas include gender studies, Indian writing in English, short fiction, censorship studies, and diaspora studies. Our second panelist is our very own Devnath Bhattak, sociologist at South Asian University, and the author of a very recent book, In Defense of the Ordinary. Coming to the author, Koral Das Gupta, is a riveting storyteller writing academic non-fictions and relationship dramas. She is currently working on the Sati series for Pan Macmillan. She has been assigned for a five book contract on mythological fiction. She is also the founder of Tell Me Your Story, a story laboratory led by crowdsourced narratives. About the book as mentioned, it is a part of the Sati series. Last year, a book entitled Ahalya was already out. This year, the book that we are discussing is Kunti. Now, this series attempts to steer the popular belief about women in Indian mythology from the leadership perspective, kind of changing the discourse of conventional narrative of South Asian women. The Sati series will discover the compassionate but independent voices of Panchakanya, which include Ahalya, Kunti, Draupadi, Mandodari, and Tara. Today's book surrounds around Kunti, as we know as a rare matriarch in Mahabharat and one of the revered Panchasatis. Yet, little is known about the fateful events that shaped her early life. Taking on the integrate task, Koral Das Gupta unravels the lesser known strands of Kunti's story through a childhood of scholarly pursuits to unwanted motherhood at adolescence, a detached marriage, and her ambitious love for the king of the Devas. With this, I would like to invite our first panelist, Priyanka Tripathi, to share her experience of the book. So over to you, Priyanka. My reading, uh, Koral Das Gupta's Kunti, is a narrative of emotional and sexual agency of a woman, uh, which also aims at exploring and representing a mythological figure otherwise marginalized in a unique socio-political space of Indian culture. Now, why I say unique? Uh, because there are several instances available in which, while the representation has been the same, the reception varied. A quick comparison as an example that I can make is the one between Vatsyayan's Kama Sutra and Mudupalani's Radhika Santwanam. Uh, Radhika Santwanam is an 18th century poetic work of which uh, K, uh, Susi Tharu and K. Lalita have extensively written. In fact, they begin their introduction by this particular book. So breasts in Mudupalani's writing were no different than the breasts in Kama Sutra. But when it was about women's sensuality in, in uh, Radhika Santwanam that invited the wrath of a lot of people, including one of the greatest uh, social reformers of our times, K. Veer Shalingam, who went on to talk about uh, Mudupalani being an adulteress and saying that there were so many parts of this book which should not be even heard by a woman, let alone uh, be written by her. Uh, she also talks about uh, he writing that uh, using Sringaras as an excuse, she uh, shamelessly fills her poems with crude descriptions of sex, which is not surprising as she's born into a community of prostitutes and does not have modesty natural to women. Now, who assigns this modesty is from the, is the kind of departure we see in Kunti by Koral Das Gupta. 
uh, so Kunti for me is very similar in the creative and, and as a kind of a creative resolution aimed at uh, looking the life of uh, Kunti as a narrative of complex conflicts. Now, conflicts between desires and doing, between Swadharm and Rajdharm, between self-imposed and world-imposed uh, dilemmas. How is it when you reach a point where you have to make a choice between your own conviction of love and socially accepted dictums of it? Kunti, therefore, is the story of any woman, then and now, seeking pleasures that Coral appropriately writes, money can't buy. Rejecting the male psychoanalytic belief that the male body and desire is the norm and woman's body is a deviation from it, Koral Das Gupta through Kunti celebrates with joy the beauty and independence of female body and juizance. For people who do not know, uh, Kunti served Sage Durvasha and pleased with her services, he blessed her with a magic formula as they, that Patnaya calls it in Indian mythology in which she could call upon any deva and have a child by him. There are many episodes you can talk about. I was particularly impressed by one uh, which uh, is about Kunti meeting with Surya. And the other was very relevant even in the context of now, uh, the, this episode, I think chapter five or six, uh, uh, where uh, Kunti gets married to Pandu and how uh, she has a lot of, uh, you know, expectations from marriage, a very normal expectation of getting love from your husband. But how she, all those expectations come crumbling under uh, under something that she had not imagined is uh, very relevant even now. So uh, I will particularly talk about, uh, uh, I mean, Kunti's meeting with Surya. So uh, when Kunti got this blessing from uh, Maharshi Durvasha uh, about uh, you know, she can call upon any deva. Previous to that, or even then, she cherished the notion that a happy relationship is the child of spiritual union. That is what Coral writes, where the intelligences of two beings communicate with each other, rising above the shores and their bodies. But she herself gets caught into the trap of dalliance by invoking Surya. And when Surya is in front of her, she questions not just the virtue of chastity, but also the fact that she 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 was not in love with Surya, and how how is she going to you know get out of the situation which she has got into due to her curiosity? And uh, very wonderfully, Surya uh, in the it, it, it's a very wonderful three page four page conversation where ultimately Surya says the mantra that brought you here is a liberation as much as it is trap. Wonderful woman. And uh, uh, to, to me, the favorite line, I think, from the entire collection, that though the whole book is full of beautiful, very meaningful lines that can just be grasped as life mantras. For me, the best one was, all blessings are hidden curse, and all curses are hidden blessing. And I rest uh, my reading here. And of course, we, I can take it up in discussion later. But yes, uh, I think. Kunti is not just then uh, about a particular narrative from Indian mythology, but a kind of a life lesson that is very relevant even now. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Uh, with this, I would like to invite our next panelist, Dev Pathak, the only man in the panel, as we already said. So let's hear it from you, Dev. Yeah, by um, uh, gender identification, only man, but uh, terribly difficult to be uh, boxed uh, uh, as far as uh, my interest in uh, reading these narratives is concerned. Uh, intellectual androgyny prevails over uh, the manifest uh, identification. And therefore, I join Priyanka in celebrating the act of reading a text like uh, this, which is not at all hagiographic account to my understanding of Kunti. Uh, abundance of televisualized accounts or popular texts, comic book accounts on some of these mythological characters we have come across since our childhood. And one always wondered while reading them or while watching some of those uh, uh, accounts on television screen, whether these characters can be presented in that mm -hmm. linearity 
uh, with that kind of simplicity. Here comes a text which will give you a sort of holistic embodiment called Kunti. And as we all know, this is second uh, before this in this series. Uh, there was another work and with these works and probably in the future also we would expect similar kind of work which will not be hagiographic in the sense that it will not just eulogize those characters. So this is also riveting uh, a book because it allows you, it invites you to join in certain kind of critical stances which emerge from Coral Coral's reading of Kunti's life and Kunti's uh, making, Kunti's dispositions. And uh, that is why it becomes far more interesting than the abundance of tales we may have heard about Kunti from a word of mouth, from passed from generation to generation or various kind of you know, popular sources. It might appear a little... Uh, a uh, bit of exaggeration, but uh, while reading this, one may be reminded of, particularly the students of social sciences, may get reminded of something which was equally marvelous, done long time ago by an anthropologist named Iravati Karve on Mahabharata. And when we read Iravati Karve's Mahabharata, we suddenly felt that this is another way of, you know, doing Mahabharata. This was, that was another way of retelling the story of Mahabharata. Kar Karve's Mahabharata was written in order to trigger a, a trail of discussion about various characters. So while reading this book, one may be reminded of that marvelous work one had read. Or likewise, it's not, uh, I'm not saying these things by way of comparing this work with Karve's Mahabharata or the second one which I'm going to name, which is Romila Thapar's Shakuntala. And with Thapar Shakuntala, again, I mean, one was really uh, uh, pleasantly surprised at that point in time when we read uh, Thapar Shakuntala, that it was inviting us for a larger debate. It was not just giving us the story or the uh, elucidation of the characters. Likewise, I felt with this book, one can go beyond the book. And that is what pro probably Priyanka was trying to suggest by giving us the background which takes us back to the questions of, you know, feminine body and the way we understand feminine body. What kind of possibilities as far as debating uh, body itself is concerned. Those possibilities emerge precisely because the author here, Coral, invites us to take a look at the character of Kunti in this book and then go beyond participating in those debates. That's where it becomes important to ask as to what the, what is the meaning of sati, uh, which has uh, informed, which has guided the previous work or even this work? And toward the end, we get an answer, not answer coming from anywhere else. It's the answer coming from the love of Kunti. I suppose, if I'm not uh, wrong, Indra answers Kunti's question. And he says, and I read out, it's on page number 200. Uh, Sati is the woman with great knowledge and power. Power I have uh, underlined heavily. She can see through people and time. With immense intelligence, she dissects the past to foresee the elements of the future. Your future I have underlined. Sati is the fearless one, not intimidated by the might of the resourceful, provoked by nothing and suppressed under no ploy, she rewrites destiny for self and others. Sati is a change maker. Now, change maker, I have underlined. You can understand uh, my personal bias in uh, reading some of these bits from the answer to the question, who is Sati? And you will realize that this answer is relevant in our time and how strongly it would be relevant for such a long time, one never imagined. This notion of sati also has to be extricated from the debates on the immolation of sati, for example, where we had one kind of phenomena of sati. It was a practice of mores. There were legal interventions. There were assertions of protests, so and so forth. Here we are 
revisiting the idea of sati without subscribing to the social mores and therefore in this act of revisiting the idea of sati we have an eye at future we have an interest we have an inclination to the idea of change maker we have an interest in a woman who would be writing her or rewriting her own destiny and that of others this is a very powerful invocation to my mind and that invocation which comes toward the end of the book actually makes you feel like going back to the beginning of the book and trying to figure out out as to how kunti has been doing precisely that throughout her biography and she has been doing it with lots of ambiguities in her mind there are trepidations moments of weaknesses everything possible with a very humanized character this is another very beautiful that's why i said it's not simple hagiography because you feel the vulnerability of this female protagonist in this story it's not a protagonist who would be uh, heroic from beginning till the end uh, the, the the protagonist is plagued by self doubt has to live through a loveless marriage for a very long while until she gets into certain kind of dialogic relation with pandu and more importantly i felt uh, was the fact that there is an emphasis on the embodied experience of of kunti here uh, it's not an experience which is coming from either nowhere or it is coming from a particular kind of ideological position it's a position which comes from the experiences of life everything that one has gone through priyanka mentioned this uh, interesting mythological fact of kunti uh, uh, pleasing or making durvasha an ever angry old man uh, sage Uh, she is successful in making him happy right and if you critically think about that episode it would uh, be compelled to think whether there is an act of inversion here because kunti is reversing that idea of taming the shrew right who is shrew here it's not a woman who is being tamed here uh, it's not kunti being tamed it's durvasha is uh, who is being tamed the ever angry old man who is being tamed and he's tamed to such an extent that he gives her the ultimate blessing of life which also results into various kind of ups and downs in the biography of kunti it is that power of embodied experience which i wanted to highlight is in this embodied experience that a notion of body a feminine body emerges in kunti's story uh, this is not a notion of feminine body which is imposed from somewhere else of course there are a socially culturally constructed idea of gendered Uh, experience no doubt about uh, nobody can dismiss that but then there is also great deal of agential liberty which is taken as priyanka was trying to highlight she is doing everything she is is like uh, edith piaf's that famous song uh, no regrets so she's going on doing everything and of course there is woeful uh, reminiscence of it on her part but then there is hardly a moment to regret about whatever she has done there is pain of you know abandoning a son there is no forgiveness for that she recognizes it but then it happened and this is part of the story and this probably is a is an inevitable consequence in the act of rewriting your own destiny right and she accepts that inevitableness of rewriting own destiny and that also allows because it's in the realm of embodied experience probably that was the reason why kunti also had the opportunity to forge alliance with many men right for example a man who is wise and cold in first appearance such as vidur right who is slightly lower in the hierarchy of status and yet kunti realizes also she hears from surya and she realizes that this man can be the real ally he can be the man to whom she can confide in right he can be he is the man who has the foresightedness and who would understand whatever she has gone through and what she is going through going to go through in future so that alliance is also this possibility of forging alliance with um, the other gender uh, men uh, that possibility is also important is not a very linear kind of feminist uh, narrative in which uh, men are demonized simply right there are demonic men and she is always uncomfortable with the, at the sight of uh, uh, the ever celebrated uh, a uh, celibate uh, bhishma but uh, but there is also a possibility that she can have a dialogue even though it is a critical dialogue with 
some of those uh, men folk and she can be equally critical with women folk for example her dynamics with gandhari in this book is amazing i mean this this was also very interesting to see that the author coral is here using some of those materials which uh, sociologists a typical social scientist particularly those uh, who uh, those who believe in uh, something elusive called objectivity they will not use some of these things called gossips rumors hearsay they will doubt them but to to curate an enchanting narrative a convincing narrative it's important to take into account all those audible uh, 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 decibels or all those sound bites right this criss crossing of various sensory uh, sen sensorial experiences is very crucial in this embodied experience of kunti which attracted me most uh, at uh, the level of you know my own interest which is very epistemological in nature i i understand the significance of this work also because a feminist scholar such as ruth vanita would look at uh, medieval uh, female scent poets and would try to see as to how there is inversion there is subversion of hierarchy there is subversion of gendered notions in the work of those medieval uh, scent poets and i feel that probably this work and more work along this line allows us to go back to some of these mythological characters and explore similar kind of possibility possibility of cultural subversion that's where i so much day for your in depth analysis of the book now i'm pretty sure all of us would be waiting to hear from our author so with this i invite uh, coral uh, definitely you are going to take us through the book but uh, even before that i would like you to also introduce us a little bit about the sati series so over to you coral thank you so much antara and thank you priyanka and dev for the beautiful words uh, it's difficult to talk about your own book and especially when two very learned people have spoken i am a little overwhelmed so uh, thank you so much and as i begin i must tell you dev that actually when we were planning uh, the production of this series the book that we had in mind was uh, iravati kaveri's yuganta so we wanted the structure to be like that we just made the look a little richer we could manage to do that simply because the times have changed and technology has changed but uh, the format is almost like that you know the uh, antara you asked me about uh, sati series uh, the how it came about actually the word sati series had the series has been named sati with a little bit of sarcasm because sati especially i come from bengal and sati doesn't have very good memories but that entire uh, women burning throwing uh, young women into fire because their husbands died that entire idea came from the fact that uh, the fact of the the idea of women's purity so all her life women proved their purity by being devotional uh, devoted towards their uh, men and when the man dies they show their devotion by jumping into the fire into a state of non existence now when i read mythology of course when i was small these same stories were told to me in a completely different format and uh, often my holidays would start with reading the ramayana and mahabharata again and again uh, then i was too small to figure why i was doing that now i feel that probably i was reading again and again because there were some very disturbing things that i felt which i was not ready to give in or i was not ready to accept that why so but i don't know why i read i just probably read because the stories felt very enchanting but uh, as i grew up uh, definitely those were some queries that uh, came up even more strongly and as i grew in my personal social uh, professional life a lot of uh, things i observed and uh, that observation actually takes uh, the author a little ahead you know in their writing journey so the first thing that came to my mind as a mother was just the basic question that who is a mother or what is a mother because in general uh, we are made to think of motherhood as a very biological concept. and this thing was uh, brought to me my ideas or brought to my observation by a man who is my husband you know because when my child was born uh, i was a very reluctant mother 
I was fine uh, with a child. I was fine without. But he had become a father much before my child had born. And I took about six months to internalize that, OK, I'm a mother. I have a small child with me now. He's crying. I have to attend. So when I look at this very construct of motherhood, and Kunti has always been seen as the mother of the Pandavas. So it did come to me at some point of time that there must be more, because that is the way I see Kunti while writing it, that Kunti is the story of the making of a mother. And that didn't happen with the birth of the Pandavas. That journey had started long back when you see that Kunti was uh, given away by Surasena to Kunti Boja, his cousin. And there is a dialogue in the book which, where Kunti asks, that, uh, why was I given away? And uh, Kunti Boja was very much uh, surprised and shocked that this question was asked. And he asked that, aren't you happy? And Kunti said, no, I'm curious. And throughout the book, uh, Kunti is shown to be a very curious woman who takes interest in things. And that curiosity lands her into trouble. But that the curiosity also ends up teaching her a lot. So when she says that, no, it's just curiosity, Surasana says, uh, Kunti Bhuja says that uh, you were born in my heart, and but in someone else's house. Uh, Kunti is happy with that answer. But in her mind, she says that there is always something about adopted children, which is very true, that how much ever love you get from the parents, there is always something about the adopted children which has no words. You don't have anything to complain. But there is something. So you know that again tells me that motherhood, or fatherhood for that matter, is very personal. It happens within a person. And the society may or may not understand that motherhood. Kunti's motherhood, definitely nobody understood. Because this entire journey, the way I have seen Kunti, I have spoken to many people, or I have heard many people discussing or deliberating on Kunti. And many people have asked me when I was writing the book, and Ahalya had just come out, they had asked me that, how are you uh, planning to portray Kunti? Would you show her as a loving mother, or would you show her as manipulative? And my answer was, uh, I would show her as ambitious. That entire journey from a manipulative to ambitious, you know, these are just two words. But there is a huge, huge difference between these two words. And there's a huge journey. Because people have chosen very consciously to call Kunti manipulative because of certain choices that she has made. The same choices that has been made by many men in the same uh, epic. But Kunti has been called manipulative because, she, because of her decisions. One of the most important decisions, because of which she gets the name manipulative, is abandoning Karna. Now, when I look at Karna, I really uh, don't know how your readers will react, but then I'll still say this. When I look at Karna, Kunti had Kunti never wanted motherhood at that time. It was forced upon her. And uh, now that the child was born, she leaves the child and continues with her life, continues with her goals, if I may say so. But then the child is also the child of Surya, the one who gets to see the three seconds of uh, life. So basically, what she had done is she had left the child to the care of the father. There are many instances where the sages have left their children, or the kings have less left their children to the care of the mother. But Kunti gets called manipulative because she took that decision. Back to Karna. Karna is told to be the most tragic hero. I have asked many that, why do you call Karna the tragic hero? And I have been told he was abandoned by his mother, abandoned by his mother. Abandoned by his mother, took it, taken care of by his father, given a Kavach Kundal. If he has given it away at a crucial time, that was his discipline, which he followed, his decision. Nobody told him to give away the Kavach Kundal. It was his decision completely. Nobody uh, provoked him. He was raised by two very loving parents who adopted him and gave him the best. He, were, he got his Shiksha, his Vidya, from the best, which is Parashuram. He comes, appears all of a sudden, he has something against Arjun, reasons best known to him. I understand that he wants to compete with the best. Absolutely valid uh, you know, uh, thing for anybody who is competitive. Any competitive player would want to compete with the best. So he comes to compete. He is not allowed to compete. What he gets is written 
in return is a kingdom so this guy who has been raised by a charioteer goes back as angaraj angaraj karna where the hell is the bechara uh, thing how is karna the tragic one now at the last episode when i offered this argument i am told that he was killed by manipulation krishna's manipulation and who who on earth killed abhimanyu yudhishthir you know these kind of things appeared again and again compared to karna i am not trying to you know put in a reverse thought i am just asking people to think a little from the broader level from an inclusive level if i may use that word i am not trying to put i am not trying to shove things down the throat i am just trying to say think about these characters these happenings from all angles be more inclusive in the decisions that you make about these characters arjun on the other hand he is born to the to pandu who was once the king the entire fight is about whose father is still legitimate to be called a king and since whose child would become the king now entire life arjun runs away from one place to the other to save his dear life finally whatever he gets whatever he earns whatever he fights for goes to his elder brother which is yudhishthir he becomes the king he, arjun remains the army general poor thing got married to draupadi by fighting it out that draupadi also becomes the wife of all the five and you call karna the tragic hero angaraj karn did anybody ever call uh, hastinapur uh, naresh arjun indraprastha naresh arjun indraprastha was fought by him he cleaned kanda uh, he uh, the, the entire uh, kandav dahan was carried out by arjun what happened yudhishthir won uh, indraprastha so there are many layers to it you know you cannot take a unidirectional uh, approach to these now coming back to kunti i call her ambitious because she is that woman who is the princess and queen of earth who had the kind of guts to say that i am the queen of earth and i deserve to find love in the king of heavens that level is her ambition and her ambition like every mother is the most ambitious one we treat mothers as you know poor bechare biruparoy we have idealized that they are the uh, they are the image of a mother figure tear jerker sacrificing selfless kunti was anything but that kunti was constantly figuring out how to create a future and her future children your children are your future your child is your future so there is no, nobody who can be more ambitious than a mother and kunti epitomizes that kind of a job description of a woman and the entire patriarchal narrative that has traveled down the year tells you that the mother is a homebound creature who must uh, attend to children and uh, she has nothing to ask for herself uh, she is supposed to obey orders and at some point of time die uh, without making any uh, without without creating any signature for herself in the world she is a future creator we have completely forgotten about that aspect of motherhood before uh, finishing this i would probably talk about two points other than while writing kunti two particular moments that i enjoyed myself building up though they were not required i just did it because i enjoyed it one was the character of madri and the other was uh, the sea of prayers that kunti hears when she is in surya's chamber those were created just because uh, i wanted to create that grandeur about these about all of them about the entire social structure or the entire uh, world that they were they were in they were uh, visiting the uh, last thing that i would like to end with is one of the most challenging things that i had to face while writing kunti was that detaching myself as an author because uh, there were many moments where i felt that i was uh, getting pulled into myself and i was traveling away from kunti 
I really had to, during my edit, self edits, I really had to throw myself away and, uh, you know, kind of see everything from Kunti's perspective. One of them being when I was doing a uh, Kunti, who is able to see the future, she gets to see Arjun pointing at the bird's eye. And initially, I had written that when she wants the bird's eye to be pierced because she wants her son to succeed in everything. And when the arrow is thrown, she closes her eyes. And when I was re uh, reading it, it just came to me that why would Kunti do this? Because she is a Kshatriya woman. She must have seen far more brutality than this. It's me. I am feeling that if I, this happens in front of me, I would close my eyes. That's the politics of animal welfare that plays in my mind, which got me to write that. So I changed that. And she kept her eyes wide open to see that the, the target is pierced. That is something that is happening to me right now. Uh, I am working on Mandodari. And the same thing has been happening because it has taken me a long time to understand who is Ravan. But that is for another discussion, another day. Thank you so um, listening to the author, I'm pretty sure our panelists have their comments to add. So I would uh, first invite Priyanka and then we'll go on to Dave. So yes, over to you. Ma. Both uh, Coral and Dave has, have spoken extensively. I just maybe uh, I would just like to add uh, about the language of the book. Uh, because uh, as a sociologist and as literature person, uh, some of us uh, have read about how feminine writing, like Helen Sisu talk about. So there is a kind of a conversational tone to uh, Coral's writing, which I felt at any point of time made me get into the character of Kunti and think uh, about those episodes that happened uh, with her. Uh, and while I was doing that, while I was reading and kind of being in that role, uh, it also happened that uh, the, the, the conversational tone led to uh, a kind of contemporizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 context. So that was not just that time that happened. Of course, you know, when we think of uh, invoking uh, uh, Deva, I, 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 um, so many times I think I also thought of Dinkar's Urvashi uh, about this whole relationship between human beings and uh, uh, God. Uh, so I, I kept on going back to Urvashi, but uh, at, at some point of time, I also felt that this was a, a very uh, a, a constructive attempt of recreating uh, a mythological figure from a woman point of view, which is otherwise uh, a man's domain. So uh, hats off to you, Coral. I'm so looking forward to uh, you creating more characters, more sati, uh, Satis from the Indian mythology. So all the best. And I'm so happy that I was part of this discussion along with uh, Dev and uh, 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 Antra. Something similar, I mean, uh... Uh, as uh, Priyanka pointed out, uh, see, these days, and it's been for a long time, we have been worried about uh, majoritarian politics presenting to us mythology in a very packaged manner, selective part of mythology to celebrate certain things. Major majoritarian politics, which also applies certain kind of inclusion and exclusion as far as reading of mythology is concerned. And therefore, time and again, we return to the exploration of Saraswati River or Ram Setu under Indian Ocean, so and so forth. We have been familiar with this uh, discourse. To my mind, the best antidote to this kind of hegemonic appropriation of uh, mythology of any religion or any cultural context, the best antidote would be to apply interpretative infinity which means basically that there, let there be many as many interpretations as possible. There may be disagreement amongst the readers about the interpretations and the arguments emerging from certain kind of interpretations. But the idea is to maintain that infinity so as there, there must not be one, one mythology, one reading of mythology uh, becoming uh, far more important, far more powerful than variety of... Uh, let there be polyphonic interpretative read readings of the mythology. And in that regard, I suppose I would like to 
celebrate this as an inter- important intervention. Uh, finally, like to invite Cordell for her concluding remarks. Actually, it's uh, I don't know what to say as a concluding remark. I just have to thank Priyanka and Dave immensely for uh, for such a close uh, you know reading of uh, this book because it was important for me uh, when I uh, when I look at this kind of work. It's important for me that parents especially read it because for a long time the stories i mean you know more in most indian households and especially in hindu households uh, we grew up the first stories that are told to us when we are very small are the stories from the ramayana and mahabharata and we are told how brave arjun was how uh, big krishna was how uh, great karna was how great bhishma was but uh, we don't introduce children to the women of the mythology that there is a need for parents to read these stories and form an opinion and probably introduce the women characters to to the boy and the girl whosoever so that they are more inclusive in understanding the courage of mythological men and women and they don't grow up with one section uh, with their pride for one section of their history so i am very happy that uh, priyanka and dev have Uh, love the stories and they both are very spirited parents i hope more parents too. um thank you so much uh, coral thank you on behalf of kalplok for the wonderful session on uh, alternative narratives questioning the celebrated imageries of ambitious characters like kunti as coral would like to call it i'm sure the readers are looking forward to the whole series coral thank you again and thank you to all the panelists